Praise God that we have a father to turn to in prayer. Isn't it great that we have a friend in Jesus and a, and a father, a heavenly father, who hears our requests and answers his children? And that is part of the theme for tonight in 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you take your Bibles, please, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 as we continue our series about a living hope that we have because we have been born again through Jesus' death and resurrection. So Peter is speaking to displaced pilgrims. These are men and women and families that have been displaced out of their region, whatever that happens to be, probably relocated to another area. They are being persecuted for their faith. They maybe are doubting, questioning. Maybe they are thinking about giving up. And the Lord is giving them encouragement and hope. And he begins in chapter 1 by just laying out the blessings of God the Father through the new birth, according to the resurrection of Jesus, through the abundant mercy, with this glorious inheritance that's reserved in heaven and I'm reserved for my inheritance, with these necessary painful trials, with a glorious unseen Savior that someday we'll see face to face, and a guaranteed deliverance. This message that I preached, the gospel message, was recorded by Old Testament prophets as they looked forward to the cross. It was declared by the New Testament apostles as they were living in the days of the cross, and you and I have received it by faith. These things which angels desire to look into. Now our response in verse 13 is to have a girded mind. Tie up the loose ends. Don't be distracted this week. Remember to rest your hope fully on the Lord's return. So we're anticipating, guess what? Tonight, Sunday night, the Lord could return for the church. Tomorrow morning, Monday morning, he could return for the church. Tomorrow afternoon he could. Do you see what I'm saying? We're resting our hope fully on the revelation of the Lord and then the fullness of our grace which we receive. And then we this morning saw that we need to have a, a pure mind to be holy as the Lord is holy in all of our conduct. This is not just outward behavior, not just some technical rule keeping, but it is an inward heart transformation where we are wanting and desiring to please the Lord above all things. Now we move to a text 
in verses 17 through 21, in the Greek, one long sentence. Isn't that neat? One long sentence in the Greek. So we're going to begin in verse 17 and look all the way down to verse 21. Here's what the word of God says. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this text and we think about having a a reverential fear of you, this evening, Father, may all of us who are listening and participating in this worship service have this awe, this awesome trembling before such a holy God and a Father. But Father, Father, we want to have this whole thought of not ever wanting to displease you, the absolute dread of displeasing you. May that fill our heart and our soul tonight and throughout this week, even until our last breath on earth or until the day of the rapture. Father, we want to live our days on earth with a reverential fear, knowing that there's an accounting before you. And so I pray that you'll use this text, Father. Help us to understand the text through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for recording it without error and preserving it for each one of us today. May Jesus Christ be glorified as our faith is strengthened and as those who are lost become saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So a reverential mind. This is the whole goal of the text. We can see here, the end of verse 17, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So we're pilgrims. We're to conduct ourselves for our time here on planet Earth, which is temporary. It's limited. And every day that clicks by, we have, another, we have one less day on planet Earth. So we're all nearing the end of our earthly journey, believe it or not, even if you're young. We don't know what holds, we don't know, we know who holds tomorrow, but we don't know what tomorrow holds for us. And so we need to conduct ourselves in a certain manner. We know it's a girded mind and, of course, a pure mind. But here he says, conduct yourselves at the end of verse 17 throughout the time of your stay here. Notice, it's just a visit. We're just passing through this world. Our home is in heaven, our citizenship in heaven, but we do it with fear. The idea of reverential fear is, as I just prayed, it is this. It is filling your heart and your mind with the dread of displeasing God the Father. We have a heavenly Father, and we are not to be afraid of him. He is a comforting, loving Father that we will spend all eternity with. But besides just the fatherly aspect, there is going to be an accounting with our Father, and he is, he's going to be the judge. Actually, Jesus Christ will be the judge, as we find out. So God the Father has delegated his uh, accounting of us to the Son, Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 5. So why are we full of dread? Not fear, not f- fear of, uh, of an angry God or of a God who we kind of cower from, but rather it's this reverential awe that says, you and I are going to meet him someday and give an account for our life. Now listen, listen everyone. What I'm talking about tonight is the most important day in your future. Get that. If you're not married, you might think your marriage is the most important day. It's not going to be. It could be having a baby. It could be having a grandchild. It could be some some event in your life that you think, wow, this is the greatest day of our life. No. This day that I'm talking about is going to happen. You have an appointment and you will show up. You don't have a choice. And it is going to be the most important day of your life. And I want to, as your pastor, prepare you for that day. Wouldn't it it make sense? Wouldn't it be awful if if I knew you were going to have this meeting with the Lord and I didn't prepare you for it? And I just sent you there? It would be terrible. It would be awful. So I want you to take into account 
why you need to conduct yourself with a reverential fear, with an awe. Well, look at the beginning of verse 17. And if you call on the Father, so if you're calling on the Father, the word if is a first class condition. You could use the word since, since you call on the Father. But I do actually, I do think Peter desired the idea of if you call on the Father, kind of like saying, if you are a genuine believer, if you are a child of God by faith, if you have a new birth because of your position with Christ by faith, and you are calling on the Father, there's another aspect of the fatherhood of God for each one of us as children. And here it is. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Okay, so this is it. The future day that you have an appointment with the Lord is going to be, it's in a day of accounting. Now, get this. It is not a day about your sin. When was your sin taken care of? 2,000 years ago on the cross. Every single sin of yours was paid in full by Jesus Christ on the cross. When he cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished, every single sin had received its full and just reward by someone else, not by you. The sin penalty that I deserve in eternity in a lake of fire was felt by Jesus Christ in my place. So this accounting is not over sin. This judging each one according to his work is not over, did you sin and are you a sinner? And there's no condemnation and there's no guilt. This, on the other hand, is a reward time. It's a time that God will evaluate your life, and we're going to look at a few texts about that, and he is going to reward you for that which was done in the body, in this body, that was good and eternal, and he will burn up that which is worthless. Okay, so that's the idea. This is not a judgment. This is not a, this is not a condemnation or a guilt session. Of a, okay, it's not a courtroom scene. How about that? This is the re, this is a rewarding of Olympic athletes by the head of the festival. Jesus, being the righteous judge, will give each one a reward according to how you ran the race. Okay. Now, let, before we go on, notice how he judges in verse seventeen. If you call on the Father who without partiality. See, there's no partiality with our God. There's, there, God is not a respecter of persons at all. And let me give you, some, let's do some quick Bible study on this. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. This is our introduction to, really, to today's justice issues regarding race and status and politics and all of these divisions in our country. Look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. Since this is the heart of the Father, this needs to be your heart and my heart. Deuteronomy 10, 17. Speaking about the Lord. For the Lord your God, here's Moses speaking to, his, to the people of Israel. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. Get that. He shows no partiality. He doesn't look at skin color. He doesn't look at, any, we're going to find four areas that God is simply impartial. All right? So he doesn't look at anything with partiality, and he never takes a bribe. You can't say, Lord, just overlook this, and let me slip in with this, and I'll give you something. Some people offer bribes to God all the time. Don't they offer bribes? They say, Lord, if you do this, um, you'll know, I'll, I'll go to church all the time if you just let me get out of this situation or whatever. That's, that's a bribe. You're saying, God, do, for some, do something for me and I'm going to pay you back with my attendance at church or whatever it might be. God doesn't take bribes and he shows no partiality. There's four areas. Look with me at Romans chapter 2. We're going to go to four different verses right now. Romans chapter 2. God is not a respecter of persons. Romans chapter 2, let's look at verses 10 and 11. God is going to reward for the believer and give them glory, honor, and immortality. And to the unbeliever, those who are self-seeking and rebellious, he will give tribulation, trial, and eternal punishment. So verse 10 but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, meaning that you are a believer, you have faith in Jesus Christ, and then out of that is flowing good works, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, a Jewish person. It doesn't matter if you're Greek. It doesn't matter if you're Finnish, 
Ethiopian, Asian, uh, Pacific Islander. There is no respect for persons when it comes to God's accounting. Jewish, Gentile, he's not looking at that. He's looking at the heart and the good works that flow out of a life that's been saved. Look at this. Go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. Another evidence of God's impartiality. This is status. So not only nationality, but status God is impartial to. Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. The word of God says, But from those who seemed to be something. There were leaders in Jerusalem who just seemed to be big shots. They were the, like the, everybody knew them. They were the national presence in Israel. They were national presence in the church. They're like people that you think, wow, I'm in the same room with, you know, somebody. It could be Chuck Swindoll, David Jeremiah. These are, are people who really have a following, right? We, we, we would, listen, we would think in heaven, a Chuck Swindoll and a David Jeremiah, man, they're going to be loaded with rewards. God's going to say, wow, hey, you were right, you were my man, and great reward for you because I kind of favor big, big name preachers like that. Little people I really don't care about, but that's not what God says. Look at Galatians 2, verse 6. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. No one. God doesn't look at your status. He doesn't look at your nationality. He doesn't say, oh, there are people that are super important in the eyes of many people. And, boy, Brian Weida, he's just coming to nobody in Hermantown. And God does not show respect regarding those things at all. Go with me to James chapter 2. You know this one. In James chapter 2, there's no partiality when it comes to wealth. James chapter 2. There's no favoritism with race, with status in society, or with wealth. James chapter 2. Verse, verses 1 through 4. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Right there, there's no partiality when it comes to believers in Jesus. You don't ever treat another race or another language or culture um, with a diminished view, ever. And, I, and I've traveled many times overseas, and I've been in the airport, foreign airports. I was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and I was in the airport there. And, and uh, I, I, I was alone. I was traveling alone on a mission trip to Kenya. And here I am in Ethiopia, and there's a group of Americans and they, were, and they were believers on a mission. And they were so rude. And they were so outspoken about the culture and the people. I was so embarrassed to be a believer. I was like, I cannot believe believers in Jesus would speak about another race or another culture like this. It was just shocking. I wanted to bring them to these different texts and say, with God, there's no favoritism. He doesn't think, you're an American. You're far greater than an Ethiopian. He doesn't look at that. What does he look at? He looks at the heart. He's the perfect judge of the heart. And then here in James 2, it's, it's um, wealth. Verse 2, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and then there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, there's no place for that. So aren't you glad that when we stand before the Father someday, when you stand before Jesus Christ at the reward seat, he's, he's going to judge everyone by the very same standard. And it won't matter if you're a pastor of a church. It won't matter if you, whatever you do, like what your position is or your skin color or your wealth or your status. We could go to one more, might as well, Acts 10. I'll just have to maybe divide this message up into two pieces. We'll do the rest maybe Sunday morning. Acts chapter 10. Look at this. Peter is in Cornelius' house. Now, a Jewish person in the Old Testament um, had become so separate from a Gentile that they would never go into a Gentile's house, ever. You, you, would, you would never step on their property. And if some dust from a Gentile piece of property came on your sandals, you would shake it off with disgust and say, Gentile dogs. Ugh. That's, that was the sharp division between Jewish and Gentile people. 
Can you imagine throwing Jewish and Gentile in the same church with that attitude? Ugh, Gentiles, they, they, I don't touch them, I don't look at them, I don't want anything to do with them, I won't eat with them. How do you get unity in a church like that? Well, we get that, we get um, Galatians, we get Ephesians, that'll teach us all about that. But here in Acts chapter 10, Peter is being told by God, go to Cornelius' house, a Gentile's house, and go ahead and eat unclean, Old Testament unclean animals. Which for 2,000 years, they never ate unclean animals because God said, don't eat them. And it became a technical law rather than a heart issue. And so here Peter's like, I have never had shrimp scampi before. I have never had a pork chop. Look at that glaze. I, I never had, I don't know, vulture. I mean, I'm trying to think of unclean animals, but I don't know if you'd eat it. But So here, Peter goes in. He's learning a huge lesson, and here's the lesson. Verse 34, Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteous is accepted by him. Any, every nation, every nation, impartiality. All right, well, that was a long explanation, but does this all make sense? Let's go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, if you are truly a child of God, your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are born again, you are his child, and he is your heavenly Father. If you call on the Father, who without partiality, he's not looking at anything that we look at. See, we look at, the, we look at the outside. God looks on the heart. He judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. All right. I'm going to take you to two texts, and then probably I'll finish the message to, uh, next Sunday morning. Um, I thought I could do all this tonight, but no way. Let's go to some favorite texts about this. Second, P- Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 and take a look at this. You already heard this morning... My favorite verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, our goal, our labor. Whether present, whether I'm alive on earth or absent, if I'm dead, I have the same goal, which is nice. I'm not switching things up uh, halfway through my, my eternal physical life here. To be well-pleasing to him. All right, verse 10. Here's what the Bible says. For we, we, every believer in the New Testament church, so from the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, until the day of the rapture, but for we must all appear. We all appear before the, the um, judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. The Bema seat was a, a raised platform. You would step up, and I could take you through the country of Greece to the ancient cities that Paul preached in, and many of the original Bemas are there. I have actually walked on the Bemas in Corinth and others that um, Gallio sat on and Paul would have been right in front of. And when you step up there, you realize it's just a raised platform like this, but there, the judge of the games, the festival, the Isthmus games, because the Olympics weren't around yet, the Isthmian games, the judge would have the, all of the athletes come forward, and he would look at the last 10 months, and he would say, in the last 10 months, are you disqualified? Have you, drink, have you had anything to drink besides lukewarm water? Have you had anything to eat besides these special dietary things? Have you broken any of the festival rules? And if you broke any of the rules, you were disqualified and you sat out. Once he cleared that you had not been disqualified, he sent you out on the track, either a discus, javelin, all sorts of activities on the track and field. And when you came back, he would say, well done, my good and faithful athlete. You get a gold, you get a silver, you get a bronze. That was the idea. So what we're being told is there is an appointment. You don't know what day it is, but it's at the rapture or after the rapture. But we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Here's what's going to happen. That each one, so it's an individual basis. Melissa, although we've been married and uh, we enjoy our, our married life and we've been an encouragement to each other, she is standing before Jesus Christ alone by herself. All right? I'm standing on my own, on my own faithful record, my own record of faithfulness or unfaithfulness, that each one may receive the things done in the body, which means on my earthly life here, what did I do with my hands? What did I do with my feet? What did I do with my body? That each one may receive the things done in the body, 
according to what he has done, whether good, meaning of eternal value, or, and the word here, bad, is the Greek word meaning worthless. He's not talking good or evil because all of our sin has been paid. So it's not a shame, guilt, condemnation session, but it's a praise, glory, and honor session. All right, so that's the idea, that we'll be receiving a reward for things done in the body, whether good or bad. Look what he says in verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. All right, so there's a fear. It's a reverential fear. It's not that you're afraid and that you're going to cower and be timid, as I said earlier, but it's like this. Listen, everybody. I'm 52, and I have no idea how long I'm going to live, but it is June of 2020. I will guarantee there's a finite number of days left on earth for me. I don't know when, but it's finite. And someday, I'm going to appear before Jesus Christ. And what he's going to do is he's going to take from the time of my salvation, and he's going to weigh out all the things I've done in my body. And the things which were done for self, self-indulgence, sin, will be burned up. And then anything that's left over will be rewarded. And you and I all are based, or will be based on the same standard. So now my question is this. What standard are you going to be judged on? I will tell you right now. You want to know, don't you? Because if you show up and you don't know what you're being judged for, what you're being rewarded for, you know it's things done in the body, and you know it's things that were good or things that were worthless. Take your Bibles, and let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. What did I say about um, holiness this morning? It's internal, and it's a matter of what? Your motives, right? Holiness is not about an external behavior, because the scribes and Pharisees had plenty of external behavior. It's about motive. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, or th- verse 13, let's look at verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living, it's alive, it's powerful. Notice that now. The word of God, the Bibles you are holding in your hand, they are alive. This word is alive, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. See, the word of, the word of God, if, if, there's, if we're a, a tripartist, if, if we think we're three people, or three parts, body, soul, and spirit, or just body and spirit part, but it doesn't matter, there's a division between soul and spirit that the word of God can locate, that I can't. The soul is my seat of emotions. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm whatever. My spirit is that which communes with God. And the Holy Spirit knows the dividing point between the two. It, 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 the word of God is that intimate, that intricate. It goes on to say this, piercing even to the, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. Now that's a, a two-edged sword. So if you thrust a, a sword in me, a jagged short sword, a makaira, it's, it, it will actually cut into my marrow. It'll go right through the bone. That's Really, that slice is deep and, and hard, right? Meaning it's going to go all the way through, no doubts, no questions. So in the same way, the word of God penetrates our hearts and it reveals. So he goes on. And is a discerner. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of my heart. The word of God is going to reveal my motive. And even the very intention. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why did I do ministry? The hardest thing about being a pastor, honestly, it is easy to fake it. It is. It's easy to fake it. Once you get going, you just get going. And you can neglect the heart. It is a dangerous calling. It's a dangerous profession or ministry or calling, I would call it, because it is possible to get all the plates spinning to wear the suit, expound the scripture, and inwardly, you're rotting. But it's also dangerous for those who are having other functions in the body of Christ. So here, he says this, the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. 
So our accounting is going to be based on the standard of God's word. And you can maybe disagree with what I say about a certain text, but I'll tell you what, if you read it and you get it, you're accountable. All right? That's it. So we got the warning. Now, um, before we close, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3 for, us, for the last part of this whole accounting before the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You'll hear some of this Sunday morning as well as we pick it up, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There were divisions in the Corinthian church. They, were, they loved to follow people, and you, you heard me preach through Corinthians now and use the book many, many times, but um, verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4 of 1 Corinthians, For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Are you not living like fleshly men and women? Verse 5, he's going to explain, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? Uh, we would say, these are mighty men of God, preachers of the word. We can follow them. And, and but he, that's not what Paul says. Who is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers, servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. In verse 6, Paul says, I planted. I planted the seed. Apollos came later and watered. But it's God who gave the increase. Paul is nobody. He's a nothing. Apollos is a nothing. It's God who is everything because God gives the increase. Without God, uh, Paul and Apollos are nobodies. They're, they do nothing and they can do nothing. But when Paul is faithful and Apollos is faithful and they're doing their ministry correctly, then God blesses and gives the increase. And the increase is, of course, new believers being discipled in the faith. And then, and then he goes, it says in verse 7, So then neither he who plants, that's Paul, is anything, nor is he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. I mean, they're unified in the ministry. There's the planting of the word of God and the, and the seed, and then there's those who come alongside and encourage those to, to obey and to grow as believers. This is a, a, one t- a one ministry. And each one, listen to this, each one individually will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So again, do you see how the same theme has been passing through this, this whole reverential fear thing? Since you call on the Father, um, who judges everyone without partiality, he doesn't judge Paul a little bit easier. Man, I mean, I'd give Paul a huge pass. I'd be like, you suffered so much, I'll just overlook a bunch of stuff. Brian, he hasn't suffered so much, so I'm going to really come down on him hard. You know, being a teacher, being a public school teacher is really difficult. Because you want, to be imp- you want to be impartial. You don't want to treat like you have favorites in class. You know, it's, it's hard because some young people, some young people, you just think, ah, you know, really? My hardest class in 25 years of teaching was when I had, I had six students on my roster. And I thought, piece of cake. No more correcting 30 papers and 30 tests. Six I can handle. It was the worst year of my life. I could not, I had to, before they came in, I had to put all the chairs against the wall and separate the six chairs as far as they possibly could be in a small classroom. And still, they poked each other with pencils and were bleeding, and then I had to get the janitor and the blood pathogens, whole thing with gloves. And then, and then it was just, I, I was like, if, if I... I'm not partial. I mean, I'm sorry. I was very partial. I was like, this is crazy. This should not be allowed. Um, And for any one of those six students listening to this live stream broadcast, I love you, and I I, I want the best for you in your life. But um, God is not like that. He's going to judge each one according to his works, to their own individual works, without partiality. partiality. Uh, Verse 9, we are God's fellow workers. We are God's field. And you are God's building. All right, so we're fellow workers with God. So here's what I want to encourage you as we just close this evening, and then we're going to pick it up here and then go into, there's really three reasons why we need to live with a reverential fear of God, with that kind of mind. The first is we're going to be accountable to be, be, we're going to be accountable to Jesus Christ for what we do in the body. Does that not give you a reason to be a little bit 
in awe with a reverential fear of God. And then there's two more reasons, and we'll cover those next Sunday morning, why, um, why we need to have this reverential awe of God. Now, I wanted to end with just one minute so I can say this. It sounds scary, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound almost like, I don't want to go to that meeting, you know? But I want you to look forward to it because there is grace. And we, we didn't get to it tonight, but in 1 Corinthians 4, after all of our motives come to light, now listen, I think about this as a pastor. When my motives all come to light, where Paul says he didn't even know sometimes his own motives, because he's a sinner. So in 1 Corinthians 4, he talks about the motives coming to light. I think I'll bring it up next Sunday morning. It says this, Then each one's praise will come from God. Okay, let me read the text, because I don't want to leave you discouraged tonight. Please, let me just read it, and I'm going to cover it Sunday morning. But listen to this, 1 Corinthians 4. All right, um, he says this, Moreover, it is required in stewards that you be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. I mean, you can judge me. Honestly, you can judge me and judge my godliness. A human court can judge me. It, but Paul says it's not going to matter because I do not even know my own heart. I cannot even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, meaning as far as he can think in his own record, he hasn't been rebellious or wicked but that still doesn't clear him. Yet I am not justified by this, he says. You know, I try to evaluate my own life and I still don't know, am I right? Are my motives really right on? I hope they are, but are they? He, he can't justify himself by his own thoughts. But he who judges me is the Lord. And we don't we know the Lord is gracious and merciful and he's full of compassion. But then he goes on. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. That's the rapture, when we uh, then will be before the reward seat. Who, who, bo who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. That's the meeting I'm talking about. But get this, then each one's praise will come from God. And note, I, I circled it and I put not guilt. Each one's praise will come from God. Now, let me, let me end with this. Because of this text... I'm going to tell you right now that when you stand before Jesus as a believer, as a child of his, I don't care what your track record is. I don't care how much sin. I don't care how much good works you've done out of your salvation. I will guarantee this. God will have a word of praise for every single child of his. Now, isn't that nice? I mean, you could, you could really have fallen away, and you could really have just at one time walked with the Lord and now you don't and you might think, man, I've just messed it up and I can never go back and why even bother at this point? But I will tell you this, if you were to go to heaven right now and Jesus were to, reward, to speak to you and reward you, he would have a word of praise. You are his child. All right, so have hope in that. Have comfort in that. Then, with this reverential fear, this week, choose to, choose to, Obey his word. Because if you obey his word, that's, what our, we're, that's the standard of our accounting. If you obey his word, then he, he has no choice but to reward you. And it's, and it's a delightful thing, right? Just don't go rebellious and wander away. All right, well, does that help you? Does that give some hope and some encouragement? Otherwise, it sounds like a death sentence. I'm going to the judgment seat of Christ, and I know it'll be a reward, but no, it's going to be... It'll be a time of, of, I think, just he's the perfect judge. All right, let's pray. I thank you, Father, that you have given us such words of warning and words of comfort. And we, we want to have a girded mind and not be distracted with the things of this world. And just remember that Christ is coming back. He will be revealed soon to us. And then we want to be living with a pure mind and being holy as you are holy in all of our conduct. And along with that holiness, this whole reverential awe, this fear of you, that we know you're our loving Father and, and you will always receive us and welcome us and what a joy it's going to be to be with Jesus. But we know that there's going to be an accounting of the things done in our body, those that are good and also the worst, worthless things. And yet you have promised that each one will receive a word of praise from you. And some more because their lives were faithful 
That's what it comes down to. And so I pray that this church would be found faithful. May it be found pure. And may it be found faithful. Oh, Father, the greatest thing we can do with our lives is to give it to you, to turn it over to you and allow you to do the work. And then we just cooperate. We just simply humble ourselves and say, I'll take whatever you, you give us, you give me, and I'm not going to cross boundaries to get that which you don't want. And I'm just simply going to live in the boundaries that you set for me. And so, Father, bless this church and build it up as a holy and a faithful church, eager for the rapture. Oh, we pray, come Lord Jesus. And if someone's listening today, maybe they need Jesus and they will now understand that they are a sinner and their sin has separated themselves from you. But Jesus Christ died in their place for their sin. He has rescued them from this penalty of sin and he has risen from the dead to prove it. And if they place their faith in Jesus Christ right now, apart from any religion, any good works that they might try to offer, if they simply rest in what Jesus Christ has done for them, they will appear at the reward seat to receive praise, and they will not be condemned to a lake of fire. So use this text and use this message in many different ways. Maybe it's partiality. Maybe somebody is just feeling partial about others a quick judge about somebody because of status, wealth, or nationality. God forbid. May we look at each one as an image bearer of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for our church. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All right, well, God bless you all. God bless you all.